Hello, and hola to those viewing our broadcast in Mexico. Welcome to number five in a series of Engineers Newsletter live broadcasts. I'm Mick Schwedler, a senior principal applications engineer trained, and I'll be your host today as we discuss building moisture and humidity management. Our goals today include sharing general information about building moisture, reviewing portions of the latest version of ASHRAE standard 90.1-1999 with respect to humidity control, doing a short psychrometric overview, and examining a number of HVAC systems to understand how each manages humidity. Following the presentations, we'll have a live question and answer session. Due to viewer feedback from previous broadcasts, we've reduced the time allotted to the question and answer session. When you fill out the broadcast survey later, please let us know how this compared to previous broadcasts. Now, let's meet today's presenters. We're privileged to have with us today Gary Lipke, a systems marketing engineer with the Train Company. During his past 20 years with Train, Gary has held a number of strategic positions. Today, his primary concentration is understanding building ventilation requirements and educating people on subjects related to indoor air quality, including moisture control. Gary will help us remember the importance of building moisture control. After Gary's presentation, I'll come back and we'll discuss how ASHRAE standard 90.1 limits simultaneous heating and cooling in various systems. Following the ASHRAE standard presentation, we'll have John Murphy, a senior applications engineer with TRAIN. John joined TRAIN in 1993 and has the distinction of being the only member of this panel with a full head of hair. In order to follow the discussion during the last segment of our broadcast, it's imperative that we understand how to analyze the performance of an HVAC system on a psychrometric chart. To prepare us, John will walk through a simplified psychrometric analysis for an example classroom. The majority of the broadcast today will be spent discussing how various systems control humidity. Dennis Stanky, a staff engineer in our applications engineering group, will walk us through the psychrometrics of various systems and discuss advantages and limitations of those systems. A 27-year veteran with TRAIN, Dennis has served ASHRAE in a number of positions, the most recent being his participation in SSPC 62.1. Following the presentations will be that live question and answer session. Any time during the broadcast, you may fax your questions to the number on your screen. Usually, we can't get to all the questions while we're on the air. We will, however, respond to all of your questions. Now, let's bring in Gary Lipke to discuss the importance of managing building humidity. Thanks, Mick. We're hearing a lot about controlling moisture in buildings these days, and for very good reason. High indoor moisture can cause a variety of problems for the building's structure, its furnishings, and most importantly, the occupants. Moisture, either in the form of liquid water or sustained relative humidity levels over 70%, can support the growth of microorganisms such as mold and mildew and increase the activity level of dust mites. Areas of the building like walls and ceilings and furnishings such as wall coverings and carpet all provide ideal amplification sites for fungi. The resulting growth produces foul odors and releases allergens and toxins, which can aggravate pre-existing respiratory problems, such as asthma, and actually cause other types of lung disease. When considering all of the needs of controlling fungal growth, managing its moisture source is by far the most effective means of control. A common misconception is that moisture control is an issue that only affects buildings in hot and humid climates. This is simply not true. Moisture problems occur in buildings in most geographic locations of the U.S. and Canada. Certainly, the increased frequency and duration of these conditions is greater in the hot and humid areas, but conditions capable of causing moisture-related problems occur throughout most areas of our country. In addition to the health issues, mold also prematurely deteriorates building furnishings and the structure. Common areas affected include the underside of wall coverings, ceiling tiles, and carpets. This photo shows a ceiling tile repeatedly exposed to moisture and as a result is now contaminated with fungi. It indicates a possible roof leak 
or an ongoing condensation problem above the ceiling. The only remedy at this point is to replace the tile. Here's a photograph from another building with a history of condensation in the ceiling plenum area. Notice the discolored ceiling tile and the deteriorated wood framing. It's important to note that the condensation in this case was not the result of insufficient insulation, but rather the lack of a suitable vapor retarder on the warm side of the insulation and walls. Deterioration of a building's materials directly increases the property's operating cost through increased maintenance and premature replacement of those furnishings. Controlling moisture isn't only a priority when the building is occupied. Facilities, such as schools, need to consider dehumidification during unoccupied periods also. ASHRAE addressed this in the recently reprinted 1999 Applications Handbook by stating, in humid climates, serious consideration should be given to dehumidification during the summer months when the school is unoccupied to prevent the growth of mold and mildew. Now that we've established the importance of moisture control, designers need to make sure they can account for all of the moisture sources in a building. Let's review some of the moisture paths. It can enter as a liquid or as a vapor. Water gets into buildings as a result of improper weatherproofing, rain and snow intrusion through outdoor air intakes, groundwater seepage, and leaking pipes and appliances. The increased use of carpeting and the wet cleaning processes they often require is becoming a significant moisture problem for many buildings. I've saved the most challenging liquid source for last. That's condensation. Water vapor condenses on any surface that falls below the dew point of the surrounding air. There are many surfaces in buildings, some exposed and others hidden, where this occurs. Cold surfaces are especially problematic in mechanical equipment rooms. Condensation in buildings can be grouped into two general categories, planned and unplanned. An example of a planned condensation path would be the cooling coil in an air handler. Because we expect the condensation, it can be effectively managed with the use of a properly designed and positioned drain pan. Unplanned condensation, on the other hand, can be especially troublesome because the condensation is intermittent and it's unexpected. Common areas with unplanned condensation are window and door frames, outdoor air intakes, and condensation within the walls, typically on the underside of wall coverings. To minimize and hopefully prevent unplanned condensation, the surface temperature of the material must be raised by applying heat or the dew point of the surrounding air must be lowered. Traditionally, insulation with a vapor retarder has been applied to cold surfaces such as pipes to raise the dew point of the surrounding air. Although fairly effective, over time, the integrity of the insulation and the vapor retarder is jeopardized through normal maintenance and deterioration. Also, some surfaces such as valve handles and gauges must be exposed for normal operation. To prevent condensation in all cases, it's prudent to supply this insulation, to supplement the insulation by reducing the dew point of the mechanical equipment room with either supply or return air. Now let's look at some of the vapor sources. Certainly, the respiration and perspiration of the occupants contribute significant amounts of moisture within a building. It's important to note that the rate varies significantly with the occupant's activity level. The ASHRAE handbook has again done a good job of documenting these variations. Outdoor air brought in for ventilation purposes can be the largest single moisture source for the mechanical system. As such, it's important to make sure they use the true worst case outdoor air conditions when designing the system. In 1997, ASHRAE began presenting design weather information as peak dew point and mean coincident dry bulb to assist engineers in determining these true worst case latent conditions. Dennis and John will discuss this topic further later in the broadcast. Vapor diffusion is another moisture contributor. Water vapor moves through solid materials in direct proportion to the difference in vapor pressure across the material and the permeance of that material. Properly applied vapor retarders can greatly reduce vapor diffusion through the building shell. ASHRAE also documents the permeance factors for many common building materials. And since no building is airtight, untreated moisture Untreated outdoor air infl infiltrates through buildings, countless small openings in the building envelope, as well as through large intentional openings such as doors and windows. Since infiltration is driven by the differential pressure across the building shell, operating a building neutral or slightly positively pressured, pressurized relative to the outdoors can significantly minimize moisture from infiltration. 
I'd like to make one last point about infiltration. It's important to recognize that moisture enters buildings around the clock. It's true that some of the moisture sources leave the building when the occupants leave, however, not all of them. Significant amounts of moisture can be drawn into a building while it's unoccupied if the building pressure is not controlled. A common scenario is a school that shuts down the unit ventilators or central air distribution shortly after the students leave for the day. Yet the bathroom, locker room, and kitchen exhaust fans continue to operate for hours, maybe even all night. The resulting negative building pressure increases the infiltration rate into the building. This has driven many designers to monitor relative humidity levels during the unoccupied period and operate the HVA system, system as necessary to maintain humidity below a preset limit. This limit is usually 60%. Special dehumidification control sequences should be considered for the unusual moisture conditions, such as a school wet cleaning its carpeting over the summer when no students are present. Then to summarize, managing moisture is important for a number of reasons, including maintaining the health and productivity of the occupants and also reducing the operating costs of a building. Now I'll turn it over to Mick to discuss the latest energy standard, ASHRAE 90.1. Mick? Thanks, Gary. In October of 1999, the ASHRAE Board of Directors gave its final approval to ASHRAE IESNA Standard 90.1, 1999, an energy standard. In it, there are limitations on simultaneously heating and cooling the same airstream. Later in our presentation, Dennis will discuss tempering of air to maintain humidity control. So we need to understand the limitations imposed by the energy standard. First, some background. Titled Energy Standard for Buildings Except Low-Rise Residential Buildings, 90.1 is a joint standard for the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers and the Illuminating Engineering Society of North America. This energy standard covers the building envelope, lighting, motors, and mechanical and service water heating systems. Therefore, it will also affect other aspects of your mechanical system design and operation. Its purpose is shown on your screen. Note that it is to provide minimum requirements and that it does not include low-rise residential dwellings, that is, family homes or duplexes. Its scope shows that it applies not only to new buildings, but also to additions and alterations. The mechanical section covers both mandatory and prescriptive requirements. Mandatory requirements include equipment efficiency, controls, documentation, labeling, and many other aspects of mechanical systems. Prescriptive requirements of standard 90.1 include economizers, fan power limitations, hydronic system design and control, and related to today's subject, a simultaneous heating and cooling limitation. Since we'll be looking at systems that may use reheat, we need to understand what's allowed by standard 90.1. The prescriptive requirements of the standard have that simultaneous heating and cooling limitation. Reheat is one form of simultaneous heating and cooling. Since the air is first cooled and dehumidified, then heated, to keep the space from subcooling. It's important to understand that reheating or recooling, as is the case of an active desiccant system, are not banned. However, there are limitations on how much may be done. These limitations are in the form of the amount of air that can be recooled, reheated, or mixed. This section covers systems that indirectly control space humidity. Before reheating or recooling can be performed, the supply airflow in the zones must be reduced to the largest of the quantities shown on our slide. There must be methods to reduce airflow prior to using reheat. The first three are self-explanatory. The fourth might require a bit of explanation. In ASHRAE Standard 62, there is an equation, 6-1, that lets a system operator minimize the system energy consumption by adjusting zone airflow. This is allowed. It's important to understand that you may do all the reheat you'd like, even for constant volume systems, if the reheat is either site recovered or site solar. 
This means that if 75% of the reheat energy comes from heat recovery or solar, you may do as much as you need without reducing airflow. If humidity is instead to be controlled directly, for example, through the use of humidistats, controls must provide and prevent reheating, mixing of hot and cold air streams, or other means of simultaneous heating and cooling of the same air stream. There are exceptions to this limitation. The system capacity must be reduced prior to reheating, or it must be a small unit. The process applications include computer rooms, museums, surgical suites, supermarkets, and ice arenas. Again, note if the energy to reheat or recool is recovered, you may do as much reheat as necessary. In my opinion, the reduction of new energy reheat will lead designers to recover heat from the cooling process. This heat may be recovered in a number of ways, from a chiller, using either a condenser bundle or with an auxiliary heat recovery condenser, from a refrigerant system desuperheater or a heat recovery coil, or from other energy recovery options, such as an air-to-air -air heat exchanger, which will be discussed in our October satellite broadcast. The standard itself was published in February of the year 2000. It affects many aspects of not only mechanical design, but also the entire building. Standard 90.1-1999 is available from ASHRAE at the website or phone numbers on your screen. One hint, if you're using their online bookstore, the old 1989 standard is on the top of the screen, while the 1999 standard is further down. Make sure you order the one you want. Now, let's join John Murphy as we walk through some psychrometric examples to prepare us for Dennis's presentation. As Mick mentioned during the introduction, later in this broadcast, Dennis is going to review various systems and how they work or sometimes don't work to control space humidity. In order to follow his discussion, it's imperative that we understand how to analyze a system on the psychrometric chart. The psychrometric chart represents the physical properties of air. Dry bulb temperature along the horizontal axis, humidity ratio along the vertical axis, wet bulb temperature on the left side, and relative humidity is represented by these curves. It's often used to graphically represent the basic processes that occur within an HVAC system. For example, if sensible heat is added or removed with no change in moisture content, the condition of the air moves horizontally on the chart. On the other hand, if moisture is added or removed without changing dry bulb temperature, the condition of the air moves vertically on the chart. Throughout this broadcast, we will consider an example classroom in an elementary school. This 1,000 square foot classroom contains 30 people and is designed to maintain a space condition of 74 degree dry bulb. Here's a schematic of the basic single zone constant volume system that serves this space. The thermostat senses the dry bulb temperature in the space and compares it to a set point. The capacity of the cooling coil is modulated to adjust the supplier temperature until the sensible capacity of the coil matches the sensible load in the space. This, me this method of control maintains space dry bulb temperature at the set point. As this system cools the air as it passes through the coil, it also reduces moisture content. The space thermostat determines the temperature of the supply air and thus the surface temperature of the coil. A colder coil surface results in more moisture condensing on the coil and in turn, a higher coil latent capacity. So how well does this basic constant volume system perform when controlling space humidity? To answer this question, I'm going to conduct a simplified psychrometric analysis of this basic system. The first step is to determine the outdoor design condition. Most designers determine the capacity of the cooling coil based on a condition when the outdoor dry bulb temperature is very high, traditionally called the design condition, but perhaps more accurately called the sensible design condition. Both the sensible load due to the introduction of outdoor air and weather-dependent space-sensible loads such as solar and conduction are greatest when the outdoor bulb temperature is highest. Designers often use weather data published in the ASHRAE Handbook of Fundamentals to determine the, the outdoor sensible design condition. 
the handbook lists a dry bulb temperature and a mean coincident wet bulb temperature for a given frequency of occurrence. For example, the 0.4% sensible design condition is 96 degree dry bulb and 76 degree mean coincident wet bulb. That, this means that the outdoor temperature exceeds 96 degree dry bulb for only 0.4% of the hours in an average year, or 35 hours. Also, the wet bulb temperature that occurs most frequently at its dry bulb temperature is 76 degrees. In many climates, however, the latent load on the cooling coil, and often the total load, that is sensible plus latent, is not greatest when the outdoor dry bulb temperature is the highest, but when the humidity ratio of the outdoor air is the highest. This latent design condition was added to the 1997 issue of the ASHRAE Handbook of Fundamentals and consists of a dew point temperature or humidity ratio and a mean coincident dry bulb temperature. The 0.4% latent design condition is 76 degree dew point and 84 degrees mean coincident dry bulb. At this condition, the outdoor air is cooler but contains more moisture than the sensible condition. Depending on humidity control requirements of the space, designers in many climates should analyze system performance at both sensible and latent design condition. First, we'll an analyze the performance of this basic constant volume system at sensible design condition, then at latent design condition. Later in this broadcast, Dennis is going to review the various space humidity control performance of various systems at both of these conditions. First, we plot the outdoor sensible design condition and the desired indoor condition on the psychometric chart. As a starting point, we'll assume the relative humidity is 50%. Next, we calculate the, space, the sensible heat ratio for this classroom. The SHR is the ratio of space sensible cooling load to total space cooling load. In our example classroom, design load calculations result in a space sensible load of 29,750 BTU per hour and a space latent load of 5,250 BTU per hour. This results in a space SHR of 0.85, meaning that 85% of the space load is sensible and 15% is latent. The quantity of air required to offset the space sensible load is determined using this familiar equation. Supply airflow equals the space sensible load divided by 1.085 times the dry bulb temperature of the space minus the dry bulb temperature of the supply air. We already know the space sensible load and the desired dry bulb temperature of the space, that leaves us with two unknowns. We can either assume the supply airflow and calculate the supplier temperature, or we can assume the supplier temperature and calculate airflow. For this example, we assume that the local building code requires nine air changes per hour of supply air for a classroom, as it does in some cities in the United States. Given that the volume of the classroom is 10,000 cubic feet, this results in a supply airflow of 1,500 CFM. Substituting these known values into this equation, we calculate the supplier temperature to be 55.7 degree Fahrenheit. The next step in our analysis is to determine the condition of the air entering the cooling coil. This is the mixture of outdoor air and return air from the space. To simplify this example, let's assume that the return air is the same condition as the space. First, we determine the quantity of outdoor air required to properly ventilate the classroom. ASHRAE standard 62 requires that the classroom be provided with 15 CFM of outdoor air per person. Since this classroom is designed for 30 people, 450 CFM of outdoor air is required. This, account, this accounts for 30% of the total supply airflow through the coil, while 70% is made up of return air from the space. The dry bulb temperature of this mixture is 80.6 degrees. Returning to the psychometric chart, the condition of this mixture must fall on a line between the outdoor and return air conditions. Having already calculated the dry bulb temperature of this mixture, we can plot its condition along this line that corresponds to 80.6 degree dry bulb. This point represents the condition of the air about to enter the cooling coil. Using the curvature of the nearest coil curves, we draw a curve from the mixed air condition until it intersects our previously calculated supplier temperature of 55.7 degree dry bulb. Finally, a sensible heat ratio line is drawn 
by connecting the 0.85 value on the SHR scale with an index point in the center of the chart. A line is drawn parallel to this SHR line from the supplier condition until it reaches our desired space temperature of 74 degree dry bulb. Now you can see that the resulting space condition is not 74 degrees 50 percent as we started with, but 74 degrees and 52.4 percent relative humidity. Because the resulting space condition is different, we'll complete another iteration on the chart to, in a sense, close this loop. The outdoor condition is the same, and we start this iteration with RA prime as the indoor condition. As before, we draw a line connecting these points to plot the mixed air condition, then follow the coil curve until it reaches our supplier temperature of 55.7 degrees, and finally, draw a 0.85 SHR line until it reaches our desired space temperature of 74. At this sensible design condition, this basic constant volume system can control the space temperature of 74 degree dry bulb with a resulting relative humidity of 52.4 percent. As I mentioned earlier, most designers determine system capacity and performance based on sensible design condition. But how does this same basic constant volume system perform at latent design condition? At an outdoor dry bulb temperature of 84 degrees and a dew point temperature of 76 degrees, the space sensible load drops to 17,850 BTU hours since the conduction heat gain from outdoors is less. The space latent load, however, remains the same since the occupants are still in the space. This results in a lower space, space SHR, 0.77. Because this is a constant volume system, the supply airflow is also unchanged. In order to offset the reduced space sensible load, this system must now supply warmer air, 63 degrees, to maintain the same space temperature of 74. Returning to the psychrometric chart, system performance at the latent design condition can be analyzed using the same iterative procedures. Using the resulting space condition from our sensible design analysis as our target, 74 degree dry bulb and 52.4 percent relative humidity, I determine the mixed air condition, follow the coil curve to our new calculated supplier temperature of 63 degrees and follow our 0.77 SHR line until it intersects our desired space temperature of 74. After completing another iteration, I find that the latent design condition, at latent design condition, this basic constant volume system can control space temperature to 74 degrees with a resulting relative humidity of 67 percent. That's pretty humid and pretty uncomfortable. It's likely to result in condensation on cool surface and as Gary mentioned earlier, high local relative humidity or surface wetness can lead to microbial growth, related structural damage, and indoor air quality problems. Now this concludes our analysis of the basic constant volume system. In summary, since the peak sensible load rarely occurs at the same time as peak latent load, cooling equipment that is selected to deliver full capacity at one peak is likely to deliver less than required capacity at the other peak. Remember, if space humidity control may be a concern, check the performance of this system at both sensible and latent design conditions. Finally, it is important to understand how various systems work psychrometrically at both of these conditions. Next, Dennis is going to review several variations of this basic constant volume system to see how space humidity control performance can be improved. Dennis? Hi, I'm Dennis. Many of you know me, and of course the rest of you do not. Today we have humidity management, or more precisely, dehumidification on our minds. Dehumidification capabilities and strategies differ by ventilation system type. For our purposes today, there are three broad ventilation system types. The single zone constant volume system is probably most widely used and is definitely most troublesome in terms of dehumidification. This system includes one constant volume air handling unit supplying a mixture of outdoor air and return air at constant volume and variable temperature to serve the air conditioning and ventilation needs of a single thermal zone. The VAV system is also widely used and is often the most forgiving system in terms of dehumidification. This system includes one air handling unit delivering a mixture of outdoor air and return air at varying volume and constant temperature to many thermal zones. 
and a VAV terminal unit to modulate the airflow to each zone. Finally, the dedicated outdoor air ventilation system, which is usually applied with local constant volume terminal units, such as water source heat pumps or fan coil units. One central air, handle, air handler preconditions outdoor air for ventilation and delivers it to local units or directly to each thermal zone. Each of these systems deserves a separate broadcast. Today, we'll focus on the very common and very troublesome constant volume system. We're going to spend the next 40 minutes or so looking at various constant volume system configurations to find out how each controls space relative humidity at the two very important operating conditions that John mentioned earlier. The first is the cooling design condition based on dry bulb temperature. As John mentioned, we call this the sensible design condition. Most designers size cooling equipment assuming outdoor dry bulb and wet bulb temperatures at or above the values that ASHRAE lists at this condition. The second is the dehumidification design condition based on dew point temperature. We call this the latent design condition. It seems that most designers ignore this condition. We'll use it today to compare the ability of various air handling systems to control relative humidity at partial sensible load. For our discussion today, it's important to remember that peak sensible load rarely occurs at the same time as peak latent load. Cooling, cooling equipment that is controlled to deliver full capacity at sensible peak is likely to deliver less than required capacity at latent peak. In John's Jacksonville example, example, sensible peak occurred at dry bulb temperatures of 96 degrees and higher, while latent peak occurred at an average dry bulb of 84 degrees. Definitely different days. Speaking of Jacksonville, this brings up a common misconception that space humidity control is only a concern in the humid climates of the southeastern United States. That's not always true. Here are the outdoor sensible and latent design conditions for three other locations, Chicago, Illinois, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and Dayton, Ohio. As you can see, the design conditions are not all that different. If you go through the same psychrometric analysis that John used for each of these other locations, you'll find that space conditions would be acceptable at sensible design, but pr would present a problem at latent design conditions. Space relative humidity ranges from 65 to 67 percent, regardless of location. Okay, with that as background, let's get started. We're going to talk about constant volume systems. For simplicity, we'll focus our discussion on commercial constant volume air handlers with chilled water coils for cooling. We'll consider several air handler configurations and learn a little bit about the dehumidification capabilities of each. Let's start with the basic constant volume system that John reviewed earlier. It has no additional equipment or control devices to enhance its dehumidification capability. It's undoubtedly the most common HVAC system in use today. John explained how it works at both sensible design and latent design. Here's a schematic of the basic system. The thermostat senses space dry bulb temperature and compares it to the set point. Then it modulates chilled water flow through the cooling coil, adjusting supplier temperature until the sensible capacity of the coil matches the sensible load of the space. The action of the thermostat determines supplier temperature and the resulting coil surface temperature determines coil latent capacity. A colder coil results in more condensation and a higher moisture removal rate. With no mechanical or control devices to enhance its ability to dehumidify the space, we say that this system provides indirect dehumidification control since coil latent capacity is really independent of space latent load. John showed us that this basic air handling system controls space relative humidity to about 52% at sensible design, but that it allows us it to rise to nearly 67% at latent design. Many designers use this basic constant volume system because it has low first cost and low operating cost. It complies with ASHRAE standard 90.1 
and results in acceptable space conditions at sensible design in any climate. However, space relative humidity can rise to unacceptable levels at part load. We showed this at one part load condition in one climate. At other outdoor conditions, the results might actually be even worse. When it's 72 degrees and raining, for instance, lower sensible loads would result in higher supply air temperature and lower space sensible heat ratio, raising space relative humidity even further. When space relative humidity rises above 60%, the system no longer meets the recommendation of ASHRAE standard 62. In summary, when control of space relative, relative humidity is an important design consideration, basic constant volume systems don't always work. So what can a designer do to enhance the dehumidification performance of a constant volume system? Many designers would decrease the ventilation load. They attribute the poor part load performance of constant volume systems to the high outdoor, outdoor air requirement of ASHRAE Standard 62, 1999 and most building codes. Many feel that constant volume system dehumidification performance would be enhanced if ventilation airflow were reduced from 15 CFM per person down to 5 CFM per person. Are they right? If we return to the classroom example and reduce the outdoor airflow from 450 CFM to just 150 CFM, mixed air drops from 30% to only 10% outdoor air. Supplier temperature and space sensible heat ratio are, are unchanged. At sensible design, space return air temperature is 74 degrees with a corresponding relative humidity of about 50% compared to 52% with, proper, with a proper ventilation rate. At sensible design, less outdoor air means a little bit lower space relative humidity, although neither 50% nor 52% RH is likely to cause any humidity problems within buildings. At the latent design condition, when 10% outdoor air mixes with 90% return air, the air enters the cooling coil at 75 degrees. Again, the supply air temperature and space sensible heat ratio are unchanged, so the space loads result in a space return air temperature of 74 degrees and a corresponding relative humidity of nearly 65% compared to about 67% with proper ventilation. Reducing the ventilation rate from 15 CFM per person down to 5 CFM per person decreases the space relative humidity from 67% to 65% at latent design. That's not much. Furthermore, just like 67%, a space relative humidity of 65% is too high. It's likely to result in discomfort and the microbial growth problems that Gary mentioned. While reducing outdoor airflow decreases space relative humidity only slightly, it does not solve constant volume system dehumidification problems. More importantly, it results in an underventilated space and the associated problems, IEQ problems, that follow. Before we leave the basic constant volume system, let's talk about one other popular dehumidification strategy. Many designers think that total energy recovery can be used with constant volume air handlers to control space relative humidity. This approach has appeal because it saves mechanical refrigeration tons. Total energy recovery wheels are available from the factory for both catalog and custom air handlers and will be discussed in detail during our broadcast in October. They save tons, that's for sure. But can they dehumidify well enough at all load conditions? Let's find out. Here's a constant volume air handling system with an energy recovery wheel installed to precondition the outdoor air. Without going into great detail, it works like this during cooling operation. The wheel bypass dampers are closed, allowing full airflow through each side of the wheel. The desiccant coated wheel revolves slowly through the outdoor and exhaust air streams, removing heat and moisture from the outdoor air stream and rejecting it to the exhaust air. In this mode, the wheel operates at full capacity, removing as much energy from the outdoor air as possible. After the outdoor air is preconditioned, the system works just like the basic constant volume system. The space thermostat controls coil capacity to maintain space temperature 
in the normal manner. How does this work psychometrically? For our classroom at Sensible Design, a 70% effective total energy wheel preconditions the outdoor air to 81 degrees. The resulting mixed air condition is 76 degrees, cooler and drier than for the basic system. Again, the cooling coil delivers supply air at about 56 degrees to satisfy the thermostat, and the space sensible heat ratio results in a space return air temperature of 74 degrees and a corresponding relative humidity of about 50%. Similar to lowering the ventilation rate, preconditioning the outdoor air using total energy recovery reduces space relative humidity at sensible design load by about 2% RH. That's a slight improvement. Now, what happens at latent design? At this condition, the outdoor air is preconditioned to about 77 degrees and the mixed air drops to 75 degrees. The coil delivers supply air at 63 degrees in order to satisfy the thermostat and the space sensible heat ratio results in a space return air temperature of 74 degrees and a corresponding relative humidity of about 65%. Total energy recovery does save operating costs by preconditioning the outdoor air. However, at latent design, it only decreases space relative humidity from 67% for the basic system to about 65%. That's not much improvement. Remember, the air passing through the supply side of the total energy wheel can only approach the space condition. It always contains more moisture than the space, so it cannot dehumidify the space. The cold coil must do that. While preconditioning with a total energy wheel reduces mechanical cooling requirements significantly at both sensible load and, and latent design loads, it has very little effect on space relative humidity. Incidentally, total energy recovery can be very beneficial when used with packaged DX equipment since they tend to raise system CFM per ton. More about this in the newsletter. At any rate, when control of space relative humidity is important, indirect dehumidification using total energy recovery might not do the job at all load conditions in all climates. Let's move on from the basic constant volume system and discuss a few dehumidification enhancement strategies. We'll start with an air handler configuration that uses coil face and bypass dampers to bypass mixed air around the cooling coil. It's very popular among designers, especially in the humid climates. Mixed air face and bypass is easy to understand and easy to implement, but can it dehumidify well enough at all load conditions? Let's find out. Here's a constant volume air handling system, enhanced with mixed air bypass. Face and bypass dampers allow mixed air to flow either through the cooling coil or around it. The cooling coil runs wild. That is, water flow through the coil is not modulated. For a given mixed air condition, the temperature of the air leaving the coil varies with air flow through the coil. This cool, dry coil air blends with bypassed mixed air to become supply air. The space thermostat modulates the, the position of the face and bypass dampers to deliver blended supply air at the temperature needed to maintain the space set point. As this system controls space temperature, it also reduces space moisture content. Some of the moisture in the mixed air condenses as it passes through the cooling coil. Airflow through the coil determines the latent capacity of the system. Like the basic constant volume system, mixed air bypass provides indirect control of space humidity because latent capacity is independent of actual space latent load. Since coil capacity is modulated by adjusting coil airflow rather than water flow, the coil surface can be very cold. This enhances the system's ability to dehumidify the space without directly controlling humidity. Let's go back to the classroom example and the psych chart to find out how well mixed air bypass dehumidifies. We can see that the space condition at sensible design load is identical to the basic constant volume air handling system. This makes sense since the bypass damper is closed and the coil damper is wide open. 
all of the mixed air passes through the cooling coil just as it does in the basic system. At latent design, some of the mixed air flows through the cooling coil, cooling it to about 53 degrees, while the remainder bypasses the coil. This 53 degree coil air and bypassed 77 degree mixed air blend to become supply air. The thermostat adjusts the air flow through the coil so that supply air temperature is 63 degrees. At this point, some of you may be thinking, why is the air coming off the coil at nearly 53 degrees? Remember that the cooling coil is allowed to run wild in this configuration, and since the same temperature and quantity of water is flowing through the coil, the reduction in airflow means that the air leaving the coil gets colder. We use the coil performance program to find the coil leaving air temperature at the required airflow. The space sensible heat ratio results in a space return air temperature of 74 degrees and a corresponding space relative humidity indirectly controlled to about 65%. That's pretty humid and it's well above the target value of 52%. Why doesn't mixed air bypass do a better job? Simply because cool dry coil air blends with warm moist mixed air which reheats it to the required supply air temperature. Since the bypass air contains a lot of moisture, the supply air contains a lot of moisture too. Mixed air face and bypass with constant volume air handlers has a reasonable first cost and low operating cost. It, it can be easily included with most air handling units from the most modest low pressure unit to the fanciest custom unit. It results in acceptable space conditions at sensible design in any climate. However, space relative humidity at part load may be unacceptable in many climates. It can rise even higher when outdoor temperature is below 84 degrees because space sensible load requires warmer supply air and the space sensible heat ratio is steeper. Cooler outdoor air results in less air flow through the cooling coil and therefore less dehumidification. When control of space relative humidity is important, indirect dehumidification using mixed air face and bypass dampers might not do the job. Let's look at another indirect approach. Return air bypass is another air handler configuration that uses face and bypass dampers. In this case, however, instead of bypassing mixed air around the coil, we bypass return air. Return air face and bypass is gaining popularity in all climates. Why is that? Can it dehumidify well enough at all load conditions? Let's find out. Here's a constant volume air handling system enhanced to include face and bypass dampers. This arrangement allows the return air to either mix with the outdoor air and flow through the cooling coil or to bypass around the coil. As with mixed air bypass, the cooling coil runs wild so the temperature of the air leaving the coil varies with coil airflow. Cool, dry coil air blends with bypassed return air to become supply air. The space thermostat modulates the position of the face and bypass dampers, simultaneously adjusting both mixed air temperature and airflow through the cooling coil so that the proper supply air temperature is delivered to maintain the space set point. As this system controls space temperature, it also reduces space moisture content by dehumidifying all of the outdoor air and that portion of the return air that bypasses through the cooling coil. Airflow through the coil determines the latent capacity of the system. Return air bypass provides indirect control of space humidity because latent capacity is independent of actual space latent load. Since coil capacity is modulated by adjusting coil airflow rather than water flow, the coil surface can be very cold. This enhances the system's ability to dehumidify the space without directly controlling humidity. How well does return air bypass dehumidify? Back to our classroom example and the psych chart to find the answer. As expected, both the space condition and the return air condition at sensible design load are identical to a basic constant volume air handling system because the bypass damper is closed 
and the fi coil face damper is wide open. All of the return air mixes with outdoor air and all of this mixed air passes through the cooling coil. At latent design, the 84 degree outdoor air mixes with return air, but in what proportion? This gets a little tricky. Let's look at the air flows in the system. The face and bypass dampers change both mixed air flow through the coil and return air flow around the coil. In effect, the face and bypass dampers change both the mixed air temperature and the blended supply air temperature. Using a table of damper positions, air flow, and resulting temperatures, along with the coil curves on the psych chart and a coil performance program, we use the trial and error process to find the only damper position that results in a blend of coil air and return air at the required 63 degree supply air temperature. At this position, the coil face damper allows 780 CFM of mixed air to flow through the coil. This means that 330 CFM of return air mixes with 450 CFM of outside air. The bypass damper, meanwhile, allows the remaining 720 CFM of return air to bypass the coil. Let's go back to the psych chart. At these air flows, 58% outdoor air mixes with 42% return air, and the coil cools this mixed air to about 53 degrees. This cooled air mixes with the bypass air, resulting in a supply air temperature of 63 degrees. As before, space loads dictate a sensible heat ratio that results in a space return air temperature of 74 degrees and a corresponding relative humidity indirectly controlled to about 55%. That's still above our target value of 52%, but it's a definite improvement over mixed air bypass. In many climates and at, and at many loads, return air face and bypass provides adequate indirect control of space relative humidity. Why does return air bypass do a better job than mixed air bypass? simply because all of the moist outdoor air passes through the coil, allowing relatively dry return air rather than relatively moist mixed air to mix with and reheat the cold, coil, the cold air leaving the coil. Return air face and bypass can be very cost effective. It's available factory installed with most catalog and custom air handlers and it limits space relative humidity better than mixed air face and bypass at both sensible design and latent design conditions. Although it allows space relative humidity to, to, relative humidity to rise at part load, its performance is likely to be acceptable in many climates. When control of space relative humidity is important and some variation is acceptable, Indirect dehumid dehumidification using return air face and bypass may be a good choice. It does a better job than, basic constant than a basic constant volume system with or without total energy recovery or a mixed air face and bypass configuration. But what if less variation in space relative, relative humidity is the design goal? What if lower space relative, relative humidity is required at all loads? In this case, indirect dehumidification methods must be abandoned. Maintaining a low space relative humidity at all loads requires direct dehumidification control. What do you think so far, Mick? Well, Dennis, what I think so far is that we've covered a lot of ground. We should probably summarize and look at the performance of the indirect dehumidification strategies we've seen so far. While we were preparing for this broadcast, I got some new insights into humidity control. The first was that the latent design conditions are substantially the same in a lot of locations. All systems controlled space relative humidity at sensible design conditions. However, at latent design we saw some variations. In fact, some large variations. The basic system was the worst letting space relative humidity rise to about 67%. No surprise here. Reducing the amount of outdoor air for ventilation, 
or adding a total energy recovery wheel does not improve dehumidification performance much, but it reduces operating cost. The next insight was really good. I've always thought of face and bypass as improving humidity control, but it really depends on which airstream is being bypassed. Mixed air bypass offers very little improvement because I end up bypassing warm, humid air and then mixing it. That's where the real eureka occurred for me. I hadn't walked through the psychrometrics of return air bypass before and had to convince myself that the control at latent design is good. In fact, of all the indirect humidity control strategies, it's the only one that really kept humidity at an acceptable level at latent design conditions. The train engineer's newsletter associated with this broadcast goes into a little more detail on each of these system configurations and discusses the impact on operating energy as well as dehumidification performance. It's on the net at train.com. Now, Dennis is going to discuss some direct dehumidification control strategies. Thanks, Mick. We refer to the first of two direct dehumidification enhancements for constant volume air handlers as separate path or dual path dehumidification. As both names imply, outdoor air and return air are conditioned separately. Many designers prefer sep to separate the outdoor path from the return air path because the treatment required in each air path may differ significantly in terms of cooling, dehumidifying, heating, and even filtering. Here's a constant volume air handling system with separate airflow paths for outdoor air and recirculated return air. In the, in the cooling mode, one co coil cools and dehumidifies the outdoor air used for ventilation, while a separate coil cools and dehumidifies the recirculated return air. The space thermostat modulates the capacity of the return air coil, adjusting sensible capacity so that the blended supply air is at the proper temperature needed to maintain space temperature. The space humidistat modulates the capacity of the outdoor air coil, adjusting latent capacity to maintain the space relative humidity at or below the target limit. Although this dehumidification enhancement can use two separate air handlers with two separate fans, it is probably best implemented using a stacked or split air handler arrangement. To save footprint, one airstream is situated above the other. Each airstream has its own coil and filters, but a single fan serves both airflow paths. We often call this separated path air handler arrangement a split dehumidification unit, and we, we refer to it as an SDU because our industry seems to thrive on acronyms. How well does separate path dehumidification maintain space relative humidity? Let's look at the psych chart again. Starting with the sensible design condition, we know from our earlier examples that the supply air temperature must be about 56 degrees. Assuming that the air handler controls are set, are set up so that each coil produces 56 degree air, 30% out, outdoor air mixes with 70% return air to deliver the supply air at 56 degrees. The space sensible heat ratio results in a space return air temperature of 74 degrees and a corresponding relative humidity directly controlled to just under 52%. This is slightly below our, our comparison target limit of 52% RH and perfectly acceptable for most applications. What happens at latent design? The outdoor air coil must dehumidify the outdoor air to a moisture content that is low enough to absorb the space latent load. To do this, our graphical analysis shows that the outdoor coil must cool the air to 48 degrees. The temperature of the air leaving the return coil must be warm enough to raise the supply air mixture to, to 63 degrees. Remember, space sensible load is satisfied when the supply air temperature is 63 degrees. Using this approach, the resulting space relative humidity is limited to 52 percent. 
to the 52% target. This constant volume dehumidification enhancement matches sensible capacity to sensible load and latent capacity to latent load. In any climate, separate path dehumidification limits space relative humidity to the target value. The outdoor coil provides both sensible and latent cooling, while the return coil provides the balance of the sensible cooling required. In effect, return air reheats the cool dry air from the outdoor coil. On a cool rainy day, when outdoor latent load is high and space sensible load is low, the return coil may actually turn off while the outdoor coil produces very cold air. In this case, additional heat may be needed to temper the supply air and maintain the required supply air temperature. Separate path dehumidification implemented with a split dehumidification unit uses only one fan to handle two separate coils. Each coil must be sized to handle its full load, but the chilled water system can be sized to handle diversity load because the sensible and latent loads don't peak simultaneously. This system dehumidifies well in any climate at both full and part load. Of course, first cost rises because we need a humidistat and two coils. It costs more, but it works. The last dehumidification enhancement for constant volume air handlers is supply air tempering. Most of you probably call this reheat, but I like to call it tempering. As you will see, the space needs sensible cooling even at part load, so supply air must be cool, but not quite as cool as required for dehumidification. Adding a little bit of heat tempers the cooling capacity of the supply air by raising its temperature a few degrees. This is very different from a true reheat system, which raises 55 degree air to 95 degrees. Anyway, here's a constant volume air handling system with supply air tempering. It has a cooling coil used for cooling and a dehumidify and dehumidifying, followed by a heating coil used for tempering. The cooling coil cools and dehumidifies the mixed air, while the heating coil adds heat, if necessary, to raise the supply air temperature to the, to the proper temperature. It, this system operates in two distinct modes. In normal cooling mode, the space thermostat modulates the capacity of the cooling coil, adjusting sensible capacity so that the supply air temperature maintains the space set point. If the space humidistat senses relative humidity above the target limit, the system switches to latent cooling mode. The cooling coil is at full latent capacity and the space thermostat now modulates the heating coil capacity to raise the supply air temperature to the level required to maintain the space temperature at set point. Supply air tempering for humidity control is very simple, very well known, and in some jurisdictions disallowed because of energy codes. Earlier Mick explained what ASHRAE standard 90.1 the energy standard allows and prohibits. As he explained, supply air tempering is always allowed if site recovered energy is used as the heat source. How well does supply air tempering control space relative humidity? Let's look again at the psych chart for our example classroom. At sensible design, the system operates in the normal cooling mode just like the basic system. At latent design, the system operates in the latent cooling mode. The humidistat controls the coil to cool the mixed air to about 55 degrees in order to limit space relative humidity to the 52% target. To maintain the space temperature at set point, the thermostat modulates the heating coil, warming the supply air from 55 degrees to 63 degrees. The space sensible heat ratio results in a space return air temperature of 74 degrees with a corresponding relative humidity controlled at the target limit of 52 percent. In any climate, at any load, supply air tempering limits space relative humidity to be equal to or less than the target set point. Supply air tempering can be accomplished using almost any air handling unit. The cooling coil and chiller must be selected for the peak total load which may occur at the latent design condition in many climates. Supplier tempering dehumidifies directly in any climate at both full and part load. Of course, 
first cost and operating cost both rise. We need a humidistat in the space, a high capacity coil, and a means of tempering. Like the separate path approach, supply air tempering for constant volume systems costs more, but it works. Incidentally, we've been talking about dehumidification during occupied operation. Sometimes space relative humidity rises when the people are gone. For instance, on weekends in an office or during the summer in a school, moisture from infiltration, wet cleaning processes, or vapor pressure diffusion may result in very high space relative humidity. Indirect dehumidification schemes that depend on sensible load are often ineffective during unoccupied periods. If humidity can rise, with no sensible load present, a direct dehumid dehumidification scheme seems almost mandatory if space relative humidity is to be maintained at all times. Let's summarize the performance of the dehumidification system configurations that we've analyzed for our classroom example. The basic constant volume system does not provide good dehumidification at latent design load. Neither under ventilation nor total energy recovery improves the, its performance. The addition of face and bypass dampers configured for mixed air bypass also does not significantly improve the basic system performance. The only indirect dehumidification strategy that provides adequate dehumidification is return air bypass. Naturally, both direct dehumidification enhancements maintain the target limit of 52%. Separate path systems implemented with the split dehumidification unit provide lower operating cost, but supply air tempering is simple, easy to apply, and energy efficient if site recovered energy is available. Well, that's about it for constant volume system dehumidification. All this talk about moisture should have satisfied your thirst for site chart knowledge. We hope to analyze dehumidification for VAV systems in a future newsletter. For now, let me just say that VAV systems provide indirect dehumidification. With proper use of terminal reheat and supply air temperature reset, they usually do a better job of part load dehumidification than any of the indirect constant volume systems, but not as good a job as constant volume systems with direct dehumidification. Dedicated outdoor air systems can provide either indirect or direct dehumidification, and air handlers that deliver 100% outdoor air open the door for a variety of energy recovery schemes. We plan to cover air side energy in detail in our October Engineers Newsletter Live broadcast. Thanks for following along with this analysis. I hope that it helped get you psyched up about dehumidification. As mentioned earlier, the engineer's newsletter associated with this broadcast goes into a little more detail on all these configurations. Mick? Thank you very much, Dennis. Obviously, we covered a lot of things in the last uh, 35 or 40 minutes. And a number of you are going to, if you haven't already, look for the engineer's newsletter on our website, train.com. Go to the commercial industrial site and then newsletters because it might take you a while to actually walk through the different psychrometrics of the systems. And now let's get to the live question and answer session. Uh, the first one, we do have quite a few questions. The first one we're going, going to give to Dennis. Dennis, the question is, uh, is two-stage direct expansion, or DX, with stacked coils, rather than a single coil with intertwined circuits, a better solution for humidity control? Well, the, the, quick answer, the quick answer for that is not really. Um, the, the, these, are, these are both uh, basic constant volume system approaches. And um, we, we actually, uh, when, we, when we look at intertwined versus, versus uh, face, face split coils, we find that, um, that there's, a, there's a slight improvement with uh, face split coils, but intertwined coils are, are much better at at improving part load efficiency, so that's why we often go to go to um, intertwine. We'll find that though, no matter how you uh, arrange the coils, that at at the part latent load condition, you're, you're going to uh, have a hard job dehumidifying, and and uh, it's not going to make much difference. 
So is that because they're both using mixed air for the, for the, to, to mix? Right, uh, they're, yeah. they're, they're both mixed, they're both uh, mixed air dehumidification systems and there's, there's, not a, there's not an enhancement there. You don't, get, you don't change the airflow through, through a part of the coil to make it colder. Okay. You just don't enhance the, the, uh, the dehumidification capability, so, so not much happens. Okay, thanks. Let's take the next one to John Murphy. Uh, John, uh, when sizing 100% uh, makeup air systems, is it proper to size equipment based on peak wet bulb with mean coincident dry bulb, since it has a greater enthalpy, or peak dry bulb with mean coincident wet bulb? It's a good question. I guess our, our broadcast today didn't really strictly cover, or specifically cover 100% outside air systems. Uh, we talked mostly about mixed air systems and, and dehumidification, but uh, the answer is yes, we, we would uh, size a 100% makeup air system on the highest enthalpy entering the air most likely. And why I say that is because it depends on the method that the 100% outside air system is controlled. If it's controlling to a fixed leaving temperature, then the enthalpy across that coil is going to be the greatest when the enthalpy of the outdoor air is largest and that would likely uh, occur at the peak wet bulb and coincident dry bulb condition in most locations, possibly not in, in some other places. Um, but if you have a system such as the split dehumidification unit Dennis talked about, that adds a little bit of difference because we're, having a, uh, we're controlling to a different leaving air temperature and that might occur at, at peak dew point day versus peak wet point day versus peak dry bulb day based on the, the location. So you should look at them all really if, it's, if you're doing those kind of systems depending on how you control. Thanks, Murph. Another one for Dennis. Uh, Dennis, uh, this comes from Nashville. Um, on the return air bypass system, it seems that we would have no outside air on full bypass. Do we start modulating the chilled water valve at minimum outside air? How, how does that work with outside air? And are we ventilating properly in that type of system? Okay, um, without going back to the picture, uh, let me just say that um, what, if you recall, the, the returning uh, air can either bypass or mix with outside air, uh, depending on the position of the face and bypass uh, dampers. If the thermostat wants, wants very little air through the coil and, and a very large amount of air through the bypass, what will happen is outdoor air will actually mix with the, the recirculated return air and bypass the coil. So rather than a mixture of outdoor air and return air through the coil, you'll have pure outdoor air, and then you'll be bypassing some outdoor air and some return air. Of course, um, you won't be dehumidifying as well under these conditions because, because you're now reheating, so to speak, with moisture air. But you'll have no, uh, you, you, you'll cause no change to outdoor airflow uh, in that situation. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Gary, one coming over to you. This one's from Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, please explain the proper location of, vape, of the vapor barrier for the building envelope to avoid travel of moisture to a space. Does it need to be on the room side or on the outdoor side of the insulation to be effective in both heating and cooling seasons? And actually, we have a couple questions on that, very similar. The generally accepted practice is to locate the vapor barrier on the warm side of the insulation. Uh, this means that depending on where the building is located, it may change um, from one side of the insulation to the other. Uh, in a predominantly cooling climate uh, or mixed, uh, mixed climates, the vapor barrier is normally on the outside of the insulation. In a predominantly heating climates, it would be located on the inside of the insulation, toward the inside of the building. So it really depends on where, uh, on what you predominantly do, heating or cooling. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, this one, I think, is prompted by a, a previous answer there, John. Uh, we'll send it over to you. Does Load 700, that's our load analysis program, uh, have weather data for latent design conditions, or do we have to override design conditions to do this analysis? So I guess the real question is, um, if I'm supposed to analyze it at a couple different uh, conditions, how do I do that analysis, and where do I get that information to do that analysis? Okay. The, uh, the train load calculation software they talk about here has has weather profiles in it uh, because the methods 
methodology used to calculate cooling loads uses a time profile during different design days. Um, it does not ha contain any peak dew point or peak wet pull data in those profiles because some assumption has to be made at either the month or the, even the time at when those conditions occur. If you recall in the broadcast, Dennis talked about the Jacksonville example and said here's the, the peak dry bulb and the peak dew point days and they're definitely different days. Uh, you have to make that assumption when that day occurs and what time of the day occurs. You can't override that information in the program to check that. So generally what I've recommended people do is, is design their system based on the weather profiles or, or calculate the designs based on the peak sensible design conditions that are in the program and then check by overriding those, that data in the program at those other conditions. And those conditions can be found in the 1997 version of the ASHRAE Handbook of Fundamentals. Great, thanks John. Uh, the next one I think I'll try to handle, and the question comes from Atlanta, Georgia. Does Train have any plans to enter the thermally regenerated desiccant 100% outside air equipment market? Uh, we're in our applications engineering department. Uh, we don't have all the answers, but I can say not that we know of at this point. Um, we have looked at the technology. We find that it can be very good for very low dew point. Um, space conditions. In most of the comfort cooling applications we're talking about, it's not necessarily and it quite often is more expensive. Uh, one thing also to recall is that the simultaneous heating and cooling limitation in, in ASHRAE 90.1 not only deals with reheat but recooling. If you're going to have an active desiccant unit in the system, that desiccant unit will dry out the air but it will also heat the air. The amount the air then has to be recooled to get us down to the uh, condition which we want our supply air. Some of that recooling energy would have to be recovered to uh, fall under the same simultaneously heating and cooling limitation in standard 90.1. So, so it's not a freebie and it's not always simple. There have to be some system things done in conjunction with that active desiccant unit. Let's take the next one to Dennis Stanky. Uh, Dennis, another dehumidification method that we didn't mention today is a heat pipe or a coil runaround loop uh, where we have a, a coil that pre-cools the entering air from the outside. It then goes through the chilled water coil and then we have a loop around where the air can then be reheated using the uh, heat from the first coil. Uh, can you discuss that a little bit? Sure, um, just a little bit. Um, I, I guess I could answer the question directly, how well does it work? The answer is pretty good. Um, uh, be, to be serious somewhat, um, the, the coil runaround scheme, which we sometimes call series energy recovery, is a uh, is a, is a uh, tempering scheme. It's, it's uh, supplier tempering like we talked about, and, and you're just using, the, in this case, the mixed air as your heat source for reheating the, the air coming off the, the coil. There's one little problem with using mixed air in this manner. It, it uh, doesn't have a lot of heat in it, especially at the part load conditions when you need a lot of reheat. Uh, so, so you can use this, this uh, method, and, and under some, some conditions it'll be beneficial, but you're probably going to have to supplement it with additional reheat anyway. Um, and then, of course, there's one, one other thing to uh, bear in mind. You put two additional coils in the airstream, that's two additional pressure drops in the airstream, and I'm not so sure that, um, that um, you, you won't be disappointed with your fan operation, or at least your fan horsepower. Murph, did you want to say something with that one also? Is that different between mixed air system and 100% outside air systems? Well, well, a little bit. We didn't talk about 100% outside air systems today, but in, in a 100% in a outside air system, what you would, where you would get the heat from would be the outdoor air. Well, the outdoor air has more heat in it than, than the mixed air. We're, in a mixed air system, if you recover from the mixed air, there's not much there to get. In, in a 100% outside air system, you recover from the outdoor air, you have more heat longer. But there's, there's still, a, you know, when it's, when it's 70 degrees outside and you need some reheat because you're doing some dehumidifying, you just don't have a lot of heat there. And um, uh, you, you might still have to supplement it with uh, additional reheat. Okay. 
Thanks. In fact, that really gets us back to uh, one of the hardest plate, one of the hardest times to dehumidify the space is when it's 70 or 72 degrees and raining outside. You have all that latent load in the air. You don't have a sensible load because you don't have the sunlight coming into the space. And that's really something that the system needs to be able to deal with in order to adequately dehumidify at all times in, at all times during the, during the year. A Murph, coming over to you. Uh, when we were going through the psychrometric analysis, um, we were looking at the coil curves and especially the mixed air and return air bypass. How is the coil capacity curve determined? Thanks. The coil curves, I think that this question is talking about that I, I used during the psychrometric analysis portion uh, are a feature on the train uh, psychrometric chart. They were developed uh, several years ago with, with lab lab test data, you know, series and series of lab test data for developing coil heat transfer surface, coil modeling programs, things like that. And we, and we generated some generalized coil curves that did a very good job of, of, of modeling the air, leaving air conditions off of a coil based on entering conditions for a wide variety of, of fin surfaces, uh, fin series, and, and coils, number of coils uh, rows. Um, so that's, that's what I used. Uh, of course, a, a performance program, a computer-based performance prediction program is, is more accurate because it will tell you based on the exact uh, configuration of your coil, but the, the generalized coils were, were generated with test data. Okay, thanks John. Uh, one from Farmington, Connecticut, and the question is, why not use hot gas reheat, not hot gas bypass, but hot gas reheat to perform humidity control? for example, in DX systems. And another question, follow-up, is how about using the condenser water as reheat? Let's take that to Dennis. Well, thanks, uh, Mick, for handing me the easy questions. I appreciate that. You bet. Um, this, of course, is in the, the dehumidification enhancement category of supply air tempering. It's just uh, a, a question of, uh, is it okay to get the heat from the hot gas in, in a DX system? Sure it is. Is it okay to get the heat from uh, tower water? Sure it is. In fact, um, wherever you can recover the heat on site, that's a good place to get it. Um, we're going to talk uh, probably more about uh, hot gas reheat in our next broadcast when we actually get into some details about energy recovery. But for now, the answer to why not use hot gas reheat is I, I can't think of a good reason why not to. I'd go ahead and do it if you have the chance. So that reheat could come either from a refrigerant hot gas or it com could come from the chiller's condenser, the tower water, or an auxiliary bundle on the condenser of the chiller. So basically sure. any place you can recover heat. Let's t take the next one over to John a Murphy. John, uh, the, and this may have been partially covered, I was going through some questions, but the part load analysis for constant volume systems did not consider coil capacity changes for different coil entering conditions, dry bulb and wet bulb at part load. Um, coil sensible and latent capacity changes with entering air temperature. Is it significant and how can it be accounted for? One question about uh Coil sensible and latent capacity changed with entering air temperatures. Yes, correct. Um, in the the analysis we used, we did ac account for the changes in in uh, entering conditions by using the coil curves on the psychrometric chart and, and following those down. Recall that the that the supplier temperature, or the leaving air temperature off the coil, is dictated by the space sensible load and the, therefore the space thermostat. So that's that's what is is driving the capacity of the coil or at least the sensible capacity for the leaving air temperature at that time. Uh, one different thing about that is in the, the two face and bypass system enhancements, uh, the mixed air bypass and return air bypass, uh, in those cases those coils were wild and so we actually used the coil performance program to, to model what the leaving air temperatures uh, conditions are off that coil based on the entering air temperature and the airflow through there because remember we were bypassing some air around have a certain amount of airflow go through the coil. And it's kind of an iterative procedure to do that. We use the psych chart and the, por and the program to come up with those answers. Thank you very much, John. Let's take this one to Dennis. It's from San Diego. 
Um, Dennis, how do you handle comfort conditioning in a laundry facility in Hawaii? And what is the most economical application? Well, the answer to part one is you use train air conditioning. Um, <laughs> uh, to, to, to again be a little more serious, it, a laundry is no different in my view than any other space that you're trying to air condition. You look at the loads, both latent and sensible, and you figure out what supply airflow you need in order to take care of the loads and what temperature it has to be supplied at. Um, the, the unique thing, I suppose, about, about a, a laundry is that you have high internal loads. That's, um, that's just something you have to deal with during the design process. See, what is the most economical application? Um, again, it's a design uh, question that has to be answered, answered by the designer. We, we know the most economical equipment solution is, well, that goes without saying. <laughs> I guess the other thing is in Hawaii, we're often gonna have uh, heat that we can use to do any reheat necessary in a tempering system. So perhaps- Good point. Perhaps that's one of the options. Good point. We will get to the questions. And as we said earlier, uh, we no longer have time. We will be answering the questions that we didn't get to on the air as quickly as we can. In summary, today we've looked at the need for humidity management, discussed the impact of ASHRAE standard 90.1, 1999 on the use of certain systems, reviewed system psychrometrics, and examined the impact of various systems on humidity management. More information can be found in the train bookstore where application manuals are available and engineers newsletters are also available on our website. Note that ASHRAE is holding its IEQ 2001 meeting in November of 2001. You might want to put that on your calendar. You can also obtain a copy of a bibliography detailing articles, manuals, newsletters, case studies, and web links that give specifics on moisture and humidity control. And that should be available from your broadcast coordinator. Before leaving, please fill out the survey given to you. It gives us great feedback, and we can alter the presentations to make them better for you next time. Thanks to Gary, Dennis, and John for presenting today. And thank you and gracias for joining us. In case you haven't heard, the Department of Energy is sponsoring a satellite broadcast on ASHRAE IESNA 90.1, 1999 on September 12th at 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The building envelope, mechanical, and lighting sections will be covered by people who served on the ASHRAE 90.1 committee. For more information, check out the website that was shown on your screen. Since we only recently received notification of the satellite logistics, not all of our train sites will be able to offer this broadcast. Please check with your local broadcast coordinator to see if they will be offering it at your site or look at the website to see the other sites that are, may be available in your locale. We look forward to having you with us again as our series of Engineers Newsletter Live broadcasts continues on October 27th. Then, we'll discuss a related topic, energy recovery solutions. See you then. <laughs>